guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations in Austin, Texas. Welcome back to the shop. I am working on my mini milling machine universal joint linkage to drive the table. And one of the components called out for a round U-joint section to have another piece of tubing pushed into it and soldered. Well, I'm not a big fan of that. I try not to solder here just because I like the challenge of saying everything is made from billet or casting or whatever you know no glue no solder no toothpaste whatever well toothpaste yeah all right this particular part to give you some idea of scale the round end, the big end right here the big end is eight millimeters across 320 ish actually it's 312 that's five sixteenths of an inch imperial the little square the protruding square on the end is 060 that's just about a sixteenth of an inch or 1.5, one and a half millimeters for all you guys that are going to leave me a nasty comment. And that is 750 long, which is just under 20 millimeters, which is, I believe is 787. So imagine doing this on an indexer in your mill. Imagine how this thing is going to jump around and bang around because when it comes down to making this end 1.5 millimeters across, it looks like that. It's pretty small. Anyway, I'm going to demonstrate a technique here that a lot of people skip right over as they're making a part. They paint themselves into a corner and say, gee, I wish something. And what you wish you had was more support on a part like this, because this thing is going to bounce around and probably pull up into the cutter and explode if you do it the way that most people would do it. Do all four sides and uh, be done with it, right? Well, I'm going to do three sides, leaving a massive amount of material on the fourth side and cut right down the center for the final cut and this little piece should just pop out of there like magic. So let's get over to the mill, put a piece of brass in an index head, use a very small cutter and see if this can actually uh, happen. One millimeter across, one and a half millimeters, 1.5 millimeters across, 20 millimeters long, eight millimeter diameter stock ish. Let's do it. Okay, Mr. Wizard, what is the big secret here? Well, really not a big secret, but here's my philosophy when it comes to cutting metal. Don't cut more metal than you absolutely have to. Why bother, right? It takes more time, wears things out. Here's your stock. Here's your final feature. 1.5 millimeter square, 20 millimeters long, 8 millimeters, 3 16 diameter. 16th of an inch diameter, three quarters long, and that's the only languages I know how to speak, so take that. The only surfaces that actually need to be machined are the four faces of this square. There you go. So I'm going to do a technique. I'm going to use a cutter just slightly bigger than that square, and I'm going to cut it into the part. I am going to Come right down to the size that I want to cut right here and when I'm done I'm going to have a c-shaped part I'm going to rotate that this way I'm going to rotate that this way and ultimately when I'm done I will have something that looks like this and the beauty of this approach is on the final pass you have almost 50% of this material still intact. So as you put the cutter, as you reverse the part in the indexer, and you position that cutter back for your final pass, you have all of this material helping keep that part in line because as it comes out from behind the cut, it doesn't need any assistance. Final step in the process is a face pass across the four faces because you're going to have rounds in these areas against the face because of the cylindrical nature of the cutter. Does that make sense? If you've ever watched my video on extended small diameter turning, this is the same concept only applied to the mill. Let's set up the dividing head, put a piece of brass in there, and see if it works. Sounds good on paper. First thing I'm going to do is figure out exactly where this cutter is supposed to be. And I'm just going to take a light dust cut across the face of this to start. Well, 
This material will ultimately be removed, but I'm going to put a square on the end to the finished size that I'm looking for, and that is just strictly to set the height of the cutter. I will remove that square when I'm done with this operation. So make it a very superficial cut, and if you have the stock, leave the stock hanging a little further out so you can take that off. Now bear in mind what I'm about to do is very risky. I know I'm about three thousandths oversized on the thickness of this part right here, but if I take a one and a half thousandths cut to clean that up and say, okay, I'm good, when I dive the cutter into a full bite, the load on the cutter is different. It may flex and that dimension may change. So I'm going to take a thousandth off of each face here and I'm just going to trust that my feed rate will be slow enough that I won't damage the part. With the height established, I'm going to now set my digital to zero on the x-axis and erase this knob right here. There's no sense in having it there. It's pointless. With the digital set to zero, I know that this face being formed, I can now trust my x-axis digital to give me the length. Then all I need to do is center it up. I'll do that by just dusting one side and watch for chips. Divide half the cutter, half the material diameter, and put this tool on center. Center line of the tool should now be over the center line of the part. The cutter is larger than the feature being cut considerably. This is a 140 diameter cutter. I'm looking for an 060 feature. I dusted the side of the part, moved over. I know however deep that witness cut on the side was, was not greater than the remainder of the diameter of the cutter versus the diameter of the dimension on the part. Here we go, 750 straight in. I think you can see three sides of a finished part right there and the mushroom support material that remains. This material on the outside is very flexible and that is about as flexible as that end feature would have been had I left it. Make the final cut and this is the last pass people. Next pass will be on the shoulder to establish all the square corners that are required. Here we go, fingers crossed. Would call that a win <laughs> at least visually right well it's one of those things you just got to think a little forward before you get yourself in trouble so i'm going to take a couple thousands more off that face to clean up that face make that nice and uniform and we'll take it out part it off measure it
Shooting for 060 on this. Let's see what we got. I am expecting some taper. Got 58 across the back. 58. 56. Fifty-six thousand taper per side, twenty millimeters long, one point five millimeters square. Now I would say overall that's a win because that's got to engage this piece of tubing right here. And it's probably good enough the way it is. But in the real world, what if you can't access the end of the part to do it that way? What if you have to have the finished part of the part sticking out, which is what's going to happen in my case, because I'm going to have a finished universal joint prep on this end of the part. So I'm going to have to back do this. I am going to have to come in from behind the head and do this this way. I wonder how catastrophic that's going to end. Let's set that up in the machine and find out. But I would say a thousand taper, a part that long, a part that small, that's a win all day long. All right, real time, seven minutes, 45 seconds doing it from behind. Let's cut that one off, clean it up, measure it. First piece we did, thousand taper per side over the length of 20 millimeters. Second piece we did, I pushed my luck. I went a little bit longer with this one. That's about... I don't know. <laughs> you tell me. 15 16th long. 937. Let's see what we got. Looking for 63. That was my target. 64 on the top. 90 degrees. 63 that way. Could be bouncing the part, could be cutter load. 65 and a half. That's typical for the thousand taper I experienced before. 65 and a half. All right. So this part is ideal back here. That is exactly what I was shooting for to interface with the other tube. Some slight file work on here, and I'll guarantee this will go right in here just fine. Give me two minutes with a file. Expect to see a better surface finish from about halfway down because that's where I want to take the material off. I'm going to mark it up with a Sharpie. And we'll see what happens.
Never trust that it's the flat to flat that's giving you the interference when you're trying to get inside of tubing. Chances are there's a radius on the inside corner. And if the radius on the edge of your part doesn't match, it's not going to go in. So give me a second to break these down a little bit further, and we'll make it fit. As promised, the front was shaved down just mildly, but there's still about a thousandth taper in this, so that is really difficult to do uh, by hand. I can set it up in the machine and do it. Also, when you cut the end of a piece of tubing like this off, make sure that the burrs are not getting in the way. One end of this was closed up, as opposed to the other end. Well, let's see what we got. I like it. I will make the one side of the universal joint, the video is coming up, I will make the small solid side exactly in this manner. So if I don't show that again, that'll be why. This is the piece of tubing that they gave you, told you to drill a hole in your part, stick this in, silver solder it in. That is certainly an option if you don't care to do the procedure the way I just showed you how to do it. Doing it from behind and moving the cutter into the collet is going to have to be the way to go because this side will be prepped. Anyway, that's all I got for you. I figured I'd throw that out there. I, this is coming up, and I wanted to try it before I got to the real deal and blew it apart. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you're well, happy, and safe. All the above. Me, Joe Pye, Advanced Innovations, Austin, Texas. 102 degrees where I'm sitting. I'm out.